whatever this is, Google and Air. Oh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael Sahota. Um, so where this whole thing started is um, uh, Ritu from the Dallas-Fort Worth user group said, hey, can you do a webinar for us? And so I thought, oh, well, hey, if I'm doing a webinar, I'd want to do it for everybody, not just for the Dallas-Fort Fort Worth user group. So um, that's, that's where this came from. And it really just started out um, with... Uh, with just, oh, can you talk about stuff, right? And I thought, okay, well, what's the most valuable stuff for me to talk about? And I thought, well, you know, I've been doing Agile for a long, long time, and I've learned a lot of things, made a lot of mistakes, and I've been really focused on culture for the last few years. And um, transformation is a big part of my story. That's where I came with the title of Agile Culture and Transformation. And, and the transformation I want to talk about is not just... Um, organizational transformation, but but personal personal transformation, and actually how these these two things things are actually very very uh, very deeply related and linked to each other. So, um, hmm. does anyone have any any questions? Um, first of all, for for everyone who's joining us via live stream, there is a Q and A uh, bar that you can click on, a Q and A button. So you can actually click on that, and um, you can ask questions. Um, so we're just giving the Dallas-Fort Worth folks another uh, maybe minute or so um, to join, uh, and then we're just going to get started whether they're they're here or not. And hopefully they'll be here because there's only 10 slots in this uh, space for this uh, this uh, cool hangout. So again, you can type questions into the Q&A button that you can use, and uh, we're going to make this interactive. So um, you, people are welcome to type in, ask before we go in the presentation um, that when I'm presenting, I'll be just seeing my presentation. So I won't actually um, be able to see uh, the questions in the presentation. So somebody who's actually on the Hangout, if you can uh, win their questions, um, just simply uh, read the questions that are getting uh, typed in and let me know what they are. Um, that'd be really, really helpful. So people who are in the Hangout can, can help me. Um, so I hear the Dallas Fort will say we're, they're ready. And, but I don't actually see them in the Hangout. Um, okay, so I guess they're as ready as they are. So let, let's get, get started. Um, and I'm going to share my screen. So here we go. This is, I'm really, really, really excited to be here and uh, connecting with everyone. All right, so here we go. So, yeah, so this is really about my journey. Um, and, you know, I can't really separate the personal bits from the, from the I guess, the the bits that are out there, the bits about Agile, the bits about culture. So um, I'll start with three years ago, I wrote this book, An Agile Adoption Transformation Survival Guide, Working with Organizational Culture. And it really was about that. It's really about my attempt to help the Agile community learn about the difference between adoption and transformation so that we could stop causing harm, we could be more successful working with organizations. And when I when I did it, I didn't really have a sense of, ooh, this is the, the silver bullet, this is silver recipe, and I, and I don't have that today either. What I do, though, is I have a much deeper sense of the problem domain, and I have a path that forward that works for me. So I want to share that. I'm really just excited about that. Um, in the book, I talked about agile, a failure being commonplace, that we don't think we're very successful, and that the number one barriers organizational culture. Um, and this is the kind of the really important bit that I found after writing the book is that consciousness of the leader is the limit for agile. So in this diagram, what we can see here is that um, if we're having this little bit of the organization that wants to go agile, have some sort of an change initiative, that the leader of that subtree of the organization, that their level of consciousness, how they're showing up, how they're trusting, how they're valuing people, that's actually the limit to how far um, the organization can go. And I noticed that on engagement after engagement that the limit of how successful Agile would, would be would always be with the most senior person, whether it's a director at some level or the CEO in an organization. Um, and, oh, I'm going to hide this message. How do I hide this? Where's my cursor? Okay, I don't know how to hide it. All right. The only thing, anyway, so this is a quote from Edgar Schein. The only thing of importance that leaders do is create and manage culture. And I found this true again, and this is like a sort of central element to how I see effective change happening in organizations. So I'm giving you the, just a brief overview of my whole story first, and then we'll go into the details. So I had this hypothesis that I need to transform first. So that in this picture, we see that in the water, we see a reflection of this, this beautiful ice crystal here. And that I need to change how I was showing up. Otherwise, the ice crystal that's sort of inside of me is going to show up in the work that I'm doing 
with, with my clients and helping them change. That I need to change how I was showing up. I need to change, shift my consciousness in order to really help leaders and organizations shift where they are. So I just went on this experiment of personal transformation, of you know being the change that I want to see in the world, and looking after how I showing I'm showing up. And I'll say more about this. And the results I just want to share the results briefly. The results are people saying things like this: I no longer wake up at 2 a.m. steering the ceiling. That's one executive said that. Another executive said, "Thank you. Today's the first good day I've had in 10 years." And I was like, "Wow! Oh my gosh!" I can't imagine the suffering you've had. And from a recent leadership workshop um, from Temenos, and I'm so so excited that Saraj is on this call, they said safe, healing, enlightened, transforming. So that's kind of the sort of the proof. So I, I ran this experiment that, oh, that you know, I need to help leaders transform and go on their journey in order for success to happen. And I, I'm really excited to say, well, ooh, it turns out this is a, a proven hypothesis. I, I've discovered that, oh, for me, this is true. So let's talk about Agile. So let's go to the big picture now. I'm going to talk about Agile culture and then transformation and a bit about my journey. Um, before I go on, are there any questions? And I can't see the actual question bar, so if someone could read that, I'll assume they're not. Otherwise, I'd like people to jump in and ask and do it as we go. No, no questions, Michael. All right, great. Thank you. So um, I'm just going to summarize kind of where things are in Agile. Some of you, hopefully a lot of you have seen this before. This is not new. But we think about Agile, that Agile practices and doing Agile are different from the Agile mindset and being Agile. Right? So hopefully everyone's on that page understands that, uh, that we need, we need to value people. That's sort of core for the Agile mindset and being Agile. In terms of a traditional modern enterprise, which is not Agile, might look something like this. We can think of this as a spe specific culture system. And that um, enterprise Agile... Um, is really about um, the adoption of agile practices. So if we think about something like SAFE, SAFE is a very safe approach to changing organizations. It's really about taking little bits of agile and sprinkling it within the organization, right? Um, whereas uh, when you think about an agile enterprise is one that's resilient, anti-fragile, this is really about a transformation to an agile mindset and culture. This is a very, very different thing. This is about creating a very, like a kind of an organization that functions like a living organism. It's a very, very different thing than putting agile practices in an organization. So this is a kind of thing we think about the difference between adoption and transformation. These are very, very different things. Um, agile transformation. Um, we, it actually is kind of like a unicorn. They're actually, in, in large enterprises, there's no such thing. Um, I heard Alistair Coburn recently say this, and this matches my experience. Right? I mean, I think there's some exceptions. This is probably the biggest sort of transformation at scale was at Ericsson, and Agile 42 did some of that work. And, you know, uh, that was like a 3,000-person business unit. But it didn't really start out with an Agile transformation. It started out with, oh, we need to transform how we're doing our work, and Agile was just part of how we did it. So what I have seen in terms of being successful, you know, especially in this includes in large organizations, is that we can see these little culture bubbles emerging. And this is a pattern that I noticed, and I've heard this reported again and again, as how people actually find success with Agile. They find some leader to create um, some new organizational culture inside some other existing organizational culture, um, and then create adapters around it to create a safe. This is the most common uh, strategy for actually getting real change in organizations today. Um, and of course, it's not stable, because if the leader goes, then, then the whole thing just falls apart. All right. Um, so I want to go on to um, go on to culture. And I really wish people asked questions, because that'll make it much more, much better for me. But um, I guess there are no questions, so I'll keep on going. Michael, when you say these culture bubbles, is it like the matrix, where the matrix keeps putting on a new new every time until mm. it's actually useful and absorbable? Mm. Mm. Can you say more? What do you mean by a new neo? You mean like a? Um, you know, like in the movie Matrix, yeah. new is a culture bubble, really, and he creates some revolution, and it works, mm. and then sometimes it doesn't work, and the architect tells him that, you know, there have been several Neos before him. Oh, so the I way see. you've drawn this model looks mm. like each culture bubble is one experiment by the whole enterprise. Mm, mm. Yeah, so um, I wouldn't make that analog, because mm. in the movie The Matrix, Neo is about changing the whole system. Mm. 
I think there's very conclusive evidence that change within the hierarchy does not result in change of the whole system. Hmm. Right? I mean, so people have been asking me, well, Michael, how can we have a revolution to overthrow the existing order? Hmm. And I haven't heard of any case studies anywhere of revolution. And w what I'll speak about in, in this session is how I've seen with leadership, leadership changing the way things work. And that's such a hard, hard journey. Um, I haven't seen stuff bubble up from underneath. Hmm. Um, I think that's one fantasy of Agile. We'll do pilot projects. Yeah. That every, everyone will see the light. Everyone will see how great this is. But if we think about this culture bubble, the green stuff is actually like an invading organism. And the, the host organizational culture will see this as an invasion and send out killer T cells or the, the Mr. Smiths of the world to kill it off. Hmm. <laughs> to come back to the Matrix example. Great question, Siraj. Um, are there other questions about Agile or where we've got to so far? No, but I'll, I'll comment on that, Michael. This is Mark Kilby. Uh, I've definitely seen the antibodies come out in different uh, organizations. So, <laughs> I, think, I think we all have. Uh, all right, let's make him going. So culture. So engagement culture and leadership are the key organizational issues. And I've got a link here to this um, 2015 Deloitte HR survey. Like This is like the top stuff. This is outside of Agile. This is just pure business. These are the hot topics. So this is like sort of central to... Ooh, Agile is actually kind of tapping into like a really big mainstream th trend going on right now. When I think about culture, I think we, we need to separate culture from tactics and strategy. And the problem organizationally that I see is that it's so easy to talk about tactics and strategy. That's where I see most of the managers and executives I'm dealing with, they're so focused on that because it's visible. That's what they're focused on. Whereas culture is this huge force acting on the organizations that's hidden. And so I guess a big part of my role and my success is helping people see, oh, well, how do we actually see culture? How do we actually look at it? How do we talk about it? Um, and one way I do it is with this. I ask, hey, where is our focus? Is it a tactical, strategic, or cultural? I just actually li literally print this out and I hand it to people. And I say, well, hey, as an as a, as a executive, as a manager, what percent of time do you spend in each of these buckets? And people write down the numbers. And then I go, okay. And let's talk about, in order to be successful in the long term, where do you need to be spending your energy? And people go, wow, I need to spending, I'm not spending my time in the right places. So people, even without telling people what culture is, they already get it. They already get a sense of, oh, we need to be spending our time and energy in different places. So there's an example of a specific technique and tool to start getting people to shift their focus on the things that will really make the difference. Uh, this is um, a beautiful diagram that I'm so, so proud of. It. So if anyone is a Doctor Who fan out there, you know, Doctor Who talks about time as a wibbly-wobbly thing that um, is the center of everything, right? In this case, you know, organizational culture is the wibbly-wobbly thing inside organizations that connect up everything. Um, that's why it's in the middle. So basically, it connects up, you know, I've broken all of organizations into people and structure. So on the people side, it connects up or with management, leadership, people's identities, values, beliefs, behaviors. Um, and it ties in with organizational structures, process policies. And we will notice here, if we, if, you know, if, if you actually buy into this model, you see, if we try to change the process and organization, that's going to create a tension with the organizational culture. And the organizational culture is going to win. The only way a process can, change can actually work is we change all the other stuff too. And this is why, you know, from the diagram, we can see it's really obvious why Agile tends to fail in organizations because it's seen as a process change, and there isn't a systemic approach to changing the organizational culture. Um, in the places where, that I've seen in my case studies where I've seen a lot of success, it's because culture is treated as a first-class citizen. Leadership is treated as a first-class citizen. Um, and we deal in a holistic way with the whole system, instead of just trying to teach, teach, you know, treat processes as a separate element and think that we, we, if we change processes, we can change the world. Um, turns out not to be true. So tip number one, use 12 scientifically proven questions to measure engagement. Uh, these are statistically proven to link to uh, link engagement to business unit performance. Uh, this is what I use with all my clients to measure ooh, our, how, where are we right now and how are we being successful. And engagement is the core driver of, you know, are people showing up, you know, with passion, with purpose. Um, and here, here's one recent um, survey I did. This is about a 40-person company. And we can see um, a plot here of engagement by staff members. So basically every data point here represents one person in the company. 
And so we can see there are a couple, so, so just to calibrate this, a two means people are strongly engaged, a negative two means they're strongly disengaged. The zero means they're kind of neutral. So we can see here the bunch of people here on the right side of the graph that are actually just disengaged or, or even strongly disengaged. And so this is kind of the, this is what drives our success. Like our, our success, and this is what Agile is all about, is about people, right? People drive successful organizations. So with people who are disengaged, it's not likely that we're going to be able to accomplish anything of much significance. Um, and here's one company I've been working with, with leadership in action, with people, leaders who are courageous and focus on changing themselves first. This is the kind of shift that they've seen in their engagement scores. And it may seem like, oh, well, they just, they, you know, they've gone from 0.45 to 0.97, isn't that nice? Well, the, the reality is here, this is like a log scale. So every, every like 0.1 is, is actually like an incredible amount of A work, and B, it's a huge shift in the actual energy. Like just from the 0.45 to the 0.62 on engagement, this w led to a noticeable difference in the buzz on the floor, right? There's a big shift in the energy um, uh, with that, that shift. So it's very, very uh, remarkable that each shift actually results in a, a big shift in how people are actually showing up and performing. Um, so that's one case study. So any, any questions about culture um, in the setup before I go on? Not seeing any questions, Michael. Okay, so just to be clear, everyone who's on air, you can type in questions in the Q&A field, and somebody who's on the Hangout should be able to see them and, and answer them. And I think there's a button you can click on to get to the Q&A field. So I'm going to continue on here, and if there are questions, I'll, I'll take them as they come up. All right, so uh, I now want to say a little bit about my journey, right? So I said, oh, well, actually, I, you know, in order to make all this stuff work, I need to go on my journey. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Uh, and just to remind you, this ties in with what I said earlier about personal transformation. Um, so, so the truth of the matter is that, this is a picture of me from 2001, is that I spent most of my life as a well-intentioned asshole. Um, and I, I use these words very, very carefully. Like, well-intentioned means I really had the best interests of people, organizations in my heart. Um, and the asshole part is that um, I didn't know how to have that come out of me in a ways that didn't hurt people. Um, there was a lot of ego going on, a um, lo lot of other things. I won't go into all the details here, but but that's actually the truth of it. So I, I, it's kind of like I really wasn't in 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 how I showed up in a place to really help organizations get to where they needed to get to. Um, and you know, here's Sheldon um, from Big Bang Theory doing his mind scan. Um, so I was kind of like a Sheldon, um, and. You know, the people who I tell this to, and they go, oh, yeah, I remember you like that. Yeah, you, <laughs> this is totally true. <laughs> or I say this now, and they go, well, actually, Michael, you know, we still see parts of this in you. It doesn't show up very often, but we do see it. <laughs> so th it's not like, a, like it's a solved problem, but it, it's, I'm, I'm in a much better place. Um, and how did I get to a better place? Because I ran experiments um, in how I'm showing up, how I'm growing, how I'm learning, how I'm developing myself. And I mean at a, at a personal um, and psychological level level. So, so one, one key element that's been going on for key experiment that I've kept as part of my toolkit now is meditation. Um, and that's been going on for about three years now. I, I, I put it as an essential practice for myself in terms of, um, I guess, you know, people floss their teeth every day, brush their teeth every day. This is like cleaning up my mind. So getting my mind into a place where I have space and can contemplate and, and, and focus on better, better behaviors. Um, the other part is is to love myself, um, and this has been a really hard one. As, as a hardcore perfectionist, um, being kind and compassionate to myself is really really tricky. Um, but here's why it's important. You know, Brene Brown says we can only be kind to others to the extent that we can be kind to ourselves. So if we want to show up and be kind and compassionate to those around us, so that we can create safety for them to make courageous choices. We need to start uh, giving that that kindness and compassion to ourselves first. Um, and depending on you know how you grew up, um, this may or may be easier or less less difficult. Um, uh, another one is using relationship to wake up. Here's a picture of my partner Deborah, 
and um, certainly very, very intentional about using relationship as a way to help us um, become our, our better selves. And that's that's a very, very key part of, of I guess, of my overall strategy. So I, I've really seen a lot of shifts um, since I started this relationship a, a year ago. And I guess the backstory there is I, I had a 20-year marriage and a divorce, and it was pretty horrific. So um, that's that's part of the story as well. All right. Keeping going, going. So I want to go on to talk about VAST, which is a model for engagement. We talked about earlier about how engagement is, is so, so very important um, for having people show up and bring their best. So, um, yeah, let me go with that. So how do we experience disengagement? Actually, I want to go back to the VAST model. So, so where did this come from? This came from a sense-making activity with Olaf Lewitz, understanding what are all the things we've been doing for the last few years that we use to help our clients and we use to help ourselves. What is, what are the, what is the core toolkit that we've been using? And this is what we came out as, ooh, this is, this is the critical bit that we've seen make a huge difference in our practices. Um, so we start with how do, before we get to how do we help people with engagement, how do we experience disengagement? Um, so what I see a lot is in organizations is, you know, trust no one. Um, that leads to a lot of fear. Um, that leads to keep calm and cover your ass. And that leads to people feeling isolated and alone. And that, that creates a cycle. I call this a cycle of disengagement. And the arrows can actually go the other way. And the things all influence each other. But often in the modern organizations, it's really sort of this uninhabitable environment. And hopefully the places that everyone here is working with, that this is not very prevalent and hopefully is maybe in the background. But a lot of organizations with this is still still a very significant significant problem. Um, so how do we actually value people to get engagement? So I'd say like a key element is safety, is people feeling safe to show up, to be themselves, to ask for help, um, trust that we trust um, other people. Like in this case, the person lower down climbing up, fully trust the other person to make sure they're safe, that they'll be able to climb up safely and successfully. Um, authentic connection, feeling... Um, connected to each other as human beings, valuing each other as human beings. Um, so oftentimes in the modern workplace, we just have the logical left brain part of her, the analytical part of us showing up. And this is about inviting the whole, whole person in. And the last bit is vulnerability. Um, vulnerability is like is um, a scary thing. Uh, I find people can feel often very uncomfortable when I talk about it. However, it's, it's, it's kind of like the secret sauce. Um, and when I say the secret sauce, it means that um, this is the core to driving success with all these other things. And Brene Brown says this. When we see vulnerability in others, we call it courage. When we see, when we see it in ourselves, we call it weakness. Uh, I just got a text saying it was dropped off. Are people still there? Hello? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, great. So I don't know what happened to the uh, Dallas Fort Worth people, but um, it looks like that. Um, it looks like people are still there. Okay, no, they're back. Okay, good. Sorry about that. I just wanted to make sure we didn't lose them. Okay. So, um, so how do we get? Pe Whoa, we're in the wrong place. Okay, so vulnerability. So yeah. So, um, so this is like the secret sauce. Um, and getting really good at being vulnerable is actually the key towards everything. Uh, Renee Brown, of course, if you don't know her, is, is the author of three three bestsellers. Um, you know, here she is with the words "I'm perfect" and "I'm enough." Um, and the way all these things work together is that when we have trust, we create safety. And when we have safety, we actually can be vulnerable. When we feel safe, we can actually be vulnerable and ask for help. Um, when we're vulnerable, that's how we actually create authentic connection, by showing up and being a whole human being, flawed, incomplete, and so on. And with authentic connection, we actually um, create trust. And so this cycle, again, these arrows you know, go this way, they also go the other way, they also are interconnected. These all sort of co are co-created together. And I call this the engagement cycle, or, or VAST, right? VAST for vulnerability, authentic connection, safety, and trust. And this is what I've seen um, in my practice in both how I show up when interacting with clients, as well as in uh, these 10 minutes leadership retreats that Siraj, who's I'm so honored is on this call, um, has introduced me to and, and pioneered. Um, in terms of helping create uh, and develop and cultivate 
these, these characteristics with leaders so that they can create more humane organizations where people can actually show up as themselves and lead to higher levels of engagement. Um, questions? Are there any questions before I go on? Uh, Michael, how, how long did it take for you to come to this model? What was it before this? Uh, well, before this, there was no model. Like, <laughs> before this, there were a whole bunch of bits and things and practices that were kind of unrelated. Like, I, I knew for me, like, Rene Brown's work on vulnerability had been an important part of how I was showing up in the work, um, but this didn't all really come together. I think this is like a, a lot of diverse influences from Brene Brown's work to Temenos to um, I think some, some work like Olaf's like coined himself as the trust artist. Um, so there are many, many diverse influences that, that helped, helped arrive at this. Hmm. Um, and the actual original version was called uh, Starve, actually. Starve. <laughs> but, but I realized that wasn't, wouldn't, wouldn't be a very good acronym in terms of a hmm. marketing model. So does that help, Siraj? It helps. I'm just wondering if you felt that it was necessary for you to have a, 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 a model like this to talk to your customers about what you do and what you offer them. Mm, mm, that's, that's a good question. So originally, Olaf and I created it primarily for our own sense-making. Yes. Right? So it started with our own sense-making of what it is we're doing and how we're successful. And mm. then, then once we had it written down and started communicating, we realized, oh, this is actually really helpful for people to understand the model. Um, so, for example, I did, a, I think, a, a Temenos workshop, I think, two weeks ago mm. with one client, one leadership team. And, you know, I, I knew the model was successful in helping people when at the closing, the, no, no, I talked about the model at the beginning just to remind people about the model because we'd already talked about it prior to that. But at the closing, people were referring to the model as like, oh, now I see how the whole workshop we just did was go through this and again and again and again, and now I see we need to work on this, and this is how it ties in. And it's like, it's like it, it really helped create a more coherent um, experience for them in that case. Um, so that, that's, that's one data point. I don't, I don't have more um, on how this has turned out. Um, okay. So um, the next bit, so there are two more bits that I want to talk about. Um, and maybe we'll just pause here to see if there are other questions. People who are on live stream, you can type in your questions versus the Q&A box on the Google Hangout site. And I'm not hearing anything, so I'll assume there are no questions. Um, so, yeah, so I want to talk about the Lulu culture model. So um, a lot of people who know my work know that um, I've been using the Schneider culture model that's in my book. Um, and, oh, by the way, the book's out, out of date, and I, I feel uh, I haven't chosen to take time to write new ones, so I'm just mad about that. Um, so, uh, so so I guess I guess this webinar is kind of a, a stopgap measure to kind of fill some of the holes of, of knowledge there. Um, so anyway, so about, uh, I don't know, a few months ago, Six months ago, I switched to the Lou culture model in terms of working with my clients as a way to um, talk about um, talk about uh, culture. Yeah, it has some advantages and disadvantages over over the Schneider model, but I'll, I'll just explain what the model is first. Right. So the, the whole point of this book, Reinventing Organizations, uh, which I, if you haven't read it, I strongly encourage you to, to read it. Uh, you know, to fully engage people, you need to change your organizational system. It's saying that the organizational system is sort of the key driver for your, your culture and how people can show up. So in it, there are four different models that I'll talk about. One is this, this power, power and structure model, um, which is like, from, is this, this model takes an evolutionary viewpoint. So this is like a very early model we de developed in our society historically, like thousands of years ago, that we create authority, formal roles, hierarchy, um, and stable process. Like you think of the Catholic Church as an example of this. This was the first sort of large scale um, structured organization that could span like you know long distances and, and a long period of time. Um, a more recent innovation would be the modern organization, like a modern um, conglomerate or uh, organization, which is all about achievement, about being number one, about product innovation, about accountability, about meritocracy. And this, you know, from previous organizational systems, was was a huge leap in 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 uh, what we're able to achieve working together. The next leap uh, in consciousness and how we organize ourselves is to have people-centric organizations, things like a uh, Southwest Airlines or Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream, where people use purpose, values, and empowerment to drive things. Um, and the, the final network, the final, um, I guess, evolutionary endpoint is this places where there's shared power, where we have a decentralized network 
where we don't just have self-organization, we actually have self-management. And that we see an emergent organization where we the, their organization is more like an organism. And people are invited to have wholeness, to show up as their, their whole selves. This is, called, this is called teal in this book. So when we see them all together, we can see this sort of this, this, this progression, this path, that as a society we've invented better and better ways of organizing ourselves. And if we actually sort of look at the, how they perform, we can see that in terms of the, the, the x-axis, that as we increase the levels of consciousness and trust, and we can include here other things like valuing people as human beings, so we see an increase in engagement and outcomes, right? So the more we trust, the more we value each other, the higher level of our consciousness, the, the better the result we have in terms of the engagement of people and the outcomes of the organization. And um, you know, I encourage you to, to go look at the book to understand the case studies and, and what the performance characteristics of these organizations are. And the difference, um, I'll just pause here to say, the difference between this model and the Schneider model is that the Schneider model is very neutral. It just talks about different organizational systems. And um, this one is actually very categorical, and this is, well, actually, we actually look at organizations in terms of how they're able to perform and how they're able to engage people effectively, there's actually, there's actually like a, a shift in terms of the consciousness and the level of effectiveness. Now, questions about this before I go on? Okay. Uh, so in terms of agile, agile culture lives here. Agile culture is largely about um, teal and green, like if we think about you know people over process, that's really speaking to this this whole area. There are little bits of of, of agile that are about um, orange, like working software. I'd say is kind of an orange thing, um, but by by and large, we take the agile manifesto um, uh, and look at it and plot it into this 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 uh, culture model. We'll see that agile is actually really about people, and it's about creating this self organization and um, giving people freedom so they can show up and do their best. And I invite you to learn more. Uh, you can check out my blog. Um, there's certainly a lot written there, as well as there's uh, this new Reinventing Organizations wiki that I, I helped actually contribute an article to, so I'm very proud about that, or uh, certainly read the book. All right. So the final thing that I want to talk about is uh, people-centric change. So so the question is, now that we know all this stuff, okay, well, we, you know, I've got to go, you know, we're, you know, I need to go change how I'm showing up. Um, actually, I'm going to back up here. Just to be clear, where, where I am in terms of my body, how I'm showing up, I'm somewhere right now between green and teal. Um, I would say probably a few years ago, I would actually have parts of me that was much more sort of orange-green. It's probably actually really how I was showing up. And in terms of me personally, trust is a current um, open area of exploration and investigation, actually fully, fully trusting people. Um, it turns out when I was young, I didn't really learn how to do that very well. And I'm, I'm continuing to work on that. So that's kind of what I'm saying. So like for organizations that really want to go to Teal, I, I can't really help them because I don't have that in my body. I can only help people to get to a green Teal area, which is a really nice place, but it's not, not all the way in Teal. Um, and that's part of my own personal growth and, and learning journey that I, I continue to be on. Um, so yeah. So anyway, so knowing all this stuff, how do we actually, or what are the kind of things that I've done in my practice that have helped these organizations get to these beautiful results. And I call this people-centered change. So probably most important one is, is what's the voice of the system, right? We have these beautiful uh, sea, sea otters sitting here, um, floating, enjoying the sunshine, perhaps eating um, some clamshells. And, you know, really, if we think of the pe these are the people in the an organization, what do these people want for themselves? What do they actually want to have happen in their organization? And this is actually part of a teal practice of we want to listen to what the system wants and then respond to that and support the voice of the system. And a lot of agile change initiatives, it's coming from the top. It's just this crushing, hey, people, go do this, right? It's not actually listening to people, not actually listening to what they want, and um, it leads to results that reflect that. But we want to have people-centered change. We want to have effective change. We really want to listen to what people want for themselves, especially what leadership teams want for themselves. Um, a critical part of what I see in my practice is, is starting with why. Asking the question, well, you want to do Agile? Why do we want to do this? Like, wh what is the outcome we're hoping for? And the reason I often ask this is so we can get Agile off the table. We may use Agile as an enabler, but 
it's really helpful to have Agile not be the goal. Um, I, I don't know, I mean, really, so if Agile's the goal and you're in an Agile transformation, I'd encourage you to, to look and invite people to ask why and create a goal that's outside of Agile. Um, and that, that's actually a, a critical, critical success technique. Um, the other one, which would seem obvious from what I've said earlier, is that the leaders need to go first. Like, um, when I invite people to change, um, it's really the leadership team saying, well, if you really want to make this successful, you guys need to go first, right? You guys get that. What's going on in your organization is a fractal of what's happening in your leadership team. If you want collaboration in your organization, you need to have, like, collaboration in your leadership team. That's kind of how those are the laws of organizational physics. If you want to trust in your organization, you need to have trust in your leadership team. So if you really want to see change, you, you need to lead the way and go first. And this has been a very successful pattern on some of the clients that I've worked with. Um, compassion is a critical part of my toolkit. Uh, I spoke to this a little bit earlier, is that, is that when we're talking to people about how their organizations are working, or in some cases not working very well, um, really the truth is, I, I'd, I'd say the truth all my life, and I used to say the truth very harshly, um, with judgment, and kind of in the back of my head thinking, ah, you stupid manager, like, why can't you see this, can't you see what's doing any better? Um, Whereas now I come from much more of a place of compassion of saying, oh, wow, these people actually really care about the organization and they're really doing their best with all the skills, with all the resources that they have. And this is a really hard problem because we're all sort of dealing with our own past, our own history. And being able to, you know, having worked on myself to the point where I can, actually can come from a place of compassion and understanding, and hopefully already a lot of you are already there at that point, um, this is actually like a crucial practice. Um, in, in, in successful organizational change. Um, the engagement cycle, vast, this is also a crucial piece. This is me being vulnerable. This is me creating authentic connections with people. This is me trusting people. And this is me focused on creating safety. I remember reading a book by Peter Block, um, uh, Flawless Consulting. And one of the things he said in there was actually the most important line in the whole book, as far as I can tell, is that he spends energy and time thinking how he can create safety for his clients to make them feel comfortable. Um, it's probably actually, you know, there's a 300 page book or something, it's probably, probably the only, the, the most valuable one or two, two, two pages in the whole book is, is about that, is about valuing the client and creating safety for them. Um, the other part is about freedom to choose. Um, the truth is, um, I often give clients a choice, leadership teams a choice. Well, you know, we can do sort of more tactical agile, or we can do this more culturally oriented thing and, you know, actually have real change and be successful. Um, and you, we have the, the picture from the Matrix because Neo's confronted with the choice of, do you, Neo, do you want to take the red pill and see the truth and see how far deep the rabbit hole really goes? Or do you take the blue pill and go back to your everyday re reality? And it turned out that when I came from a place of judgment, when I came from a place of coercing, coer coercing managers and leaders to take the red pill, they would take the blue pill because they didn't like being coerced. As soon as I stopped, I stopped them, the majority of the leadership teams that I'm working with taking the red pill. That as soon as I give them the freedom, like in my heart, really saying, oh, you know what, if you want to do something tactical, I'm okay with that. If you want to do something cultural and leadership based, I'm, I'm good with that. You know, it's your organization, you decide. I'm here to support you on your journey. And whatever step you take on your journey is wonderful. And when I came from that place of honestly wishing them the best and supporting them no matter what they do, then I, just, just beautiful things emerge. And I can tell you, like, two startups I started with this spring, one took, I guess, maybe quite kind of the blue pill and is doing a very conservative, more tactical approach, and I'm helping them on that journey. Another client's taking a leadership-first cultural approach, and I'm helping them that. And when I come from this place of being okay, I'm just really appreciative of helping anyone on their journey, um, regardless of which, which journey they choose. Um, letting go of Agile, I spoke to this earlier, that when we cling to Agile as the goal or the thing, it actually kills it. We, we need to, or success, I've seen greater success by creating goals of the organization, like what do we want? Oh, we want to have a great product, or we want to people love coming to work, um, as, as great goals to have for an organization. And we may use Agile to help us get there. Um, but the problem is if we cling to Agile, then Agile starts getting used like a whip or a shield. Um, and cause so much damage in organizations. Uh, here, here's a graphic from Olaf Lewitz. It's called the champagne, sparkling champagne glass. And we start this at the bottom. 
and we start with raising awareness. As a change agent, we want to go and raise awareness of some issue of like people's dissatisfaction or conflict in the organization, and then help people identify options and then make choices. This is kind of like, you know, I guess this can be seen as a, a change model. Um, you could actually see this as the adaptive systems action loop of what, so what, now what. Um, but I, I like the, the notion of, of having choices and identifying options because that, that's what really creates freedom and choice. Um, the other thing that is really helpful that I've seen in my practice is engaging to let go of control. Um, so I've really stepped away from telling people what to do and being moved much more towards giving people advice and helping management um, let go of control and move much more towards engaging with people and co-creating rather than driving and controlling. Um, we want to make choices together. That means me as a change in making choices together with the leadership team and the leadership team making choices with people that work in their organizations. Um, and finally, if we have really great ideas, we can rely on them to spread organically. Like a dandelion seeds just spread, they just blow in the wind, and if they land on fertile soil, they'll grow there. So if we have a great idea, agile, quality product, engage people, if it's a great idea people want to do, we don't need to sell it. We don't need to try to get people to force people to do it. It'll, it'll just happen. Um, and this is a graphic that ties back in with my hypothesis um, that personal transformation is the heart of organizational transformation. That um, when we focus on things like authentic connection, being present, seeing others as human beings, trust, empathy, compassion, being authentic, being okay with our flaws, valuing ourselves, um, that is really the core of organizational transformation. So if we want to have this shift in consciousness, this shift to higher um, conscious uh, organizational structures that have higher levels of performance and success and engagement, then we need to start here. As change agents, we need to start with um, ourselves um, and invite leaders to come with us. And Olaf says this, inviting people to personal transformation is the key to transformation of the whole organization. And specifically here, inviting everyone, leaders, workers, to, to come on this, this journey with us. So it really starts with us, you know, I invite you to be the change that you want to see in the world um, and, and really, really start with yourself. Start with how you're showing up and, where, and be honest and where are you in your journey and be kind to yourself about that and say where do the areas that need to grow so that I can show up in a way where people go, oh yeah, oh I, I can see that fully, you know, I'm, there's, there, there's alignment of, of where we're trying to get to with, with how we personally are behaving. And you know, this is a destination, um, and my invitation is, is let's travel together. Um, and if you want help in your journey, this is some of the stuff that I help people with, one-on-one um, -on -one coaching, culture and leadership training. Right? I call it much more coaching and guiding um, these days, or check out my blog and website. So what I'd like to do is go, go, to, um, go to question and answer. So I'm going to come back uh, and move away from the slides and go back to everyone. So people can, you can type in questions in the uh, Q&A box uh, or in, um, hi, I'm back. So, okay, so I see there's some questions here. Uh, Michael Spade, uh, don't agree green is higher on outcomes. Okay, um, do agree it's higher on engagement and consciousness. Okay, um, so um, I'll trust Michael on that one. My, my understanding is that um, with um, the organizational systems where we value people more, where there's more engagement, um, and I think, I think I, Michael, I know where you might be coming from, and um, maybe you can type question, further questions if in, the, in the dialogue here. My understanding is that when there are different culture systems, the green that is talked about in... Um, reinventing organizations is a very specific kind of green. It's about using valuing people as a way to amplify getting organizational results, which I think is different from the green in a spiral model, which is much more focused on people and valuing people over results. Um, so I, I feel like the greens might be different than the greens we're talking about here. Um, and that's perhaps why I think that they're, they're actually, it does matter which, which, um, which culture model you use. Um, and certainly uh, my comment on spiral dynamics is it, it, I never figured out how to actually directly apply it to helping my clients. 
or helping my own practice. Whereas um, the Lulu Culture model I found has been very, very helpful for me um, and, and for my clients. Um, okay, so uh, are, can people type in other questions? Um, or people who are on the Hangout can certainly unmute yourself and ask questions. I'd love to hear from you. Michael, this is Siraj. Hi, Siraj. Uh, posed a question earlier on the chat. Mm -hmm. So when you present yourself as, as a cultural transformation agent, mm -hmm. not an agile, not an agile mm -hmm. what are your customers are your customers of you? Hmm. Um, let me let me answer this in two parts. So, um, probably the word I'd use to best describe myself as a guide at this point. Mm -hmm. I was using Catalyst. I think I'm just changing the language around around being much more of a guide, I'm helping people on their journey. Is sort of how I'm thinking of myself. In terms of how I'm approaching the marketplace, um, it's really like a lot of my work is really coming from people who are interested in the agile space and because they want to get the results. So it's inviting them to look at a bigger bigger discourse. Because um, a lot of people who are interested in Agile are actually interested in getting like the deeper result, the deeper success. So it's inviting them to a broader conversation. Uh, and that kind of ties back into the discussion around choice and invitation. That, does that, did that help answer your question? Yeah, I think it answers half. half. The second okay, half can you say what's the other half? What are they asking of you? So you present yourself as a guide? A guide? Yeah. What, what what are they asking you, to, asking do? you to do? Well, they don't they don't ask me to do anything. I just tell them what we're gonna, <laughs> I ask them where they want to go, and I say, okay, well, we should go do this. <laughs> and then we go do it. Like it's <laughs> they, they don't they don't ask anything. I mean, <laughs> they, they're just really happy to be on the journey. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Is that is it, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's what's been happening. I see. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. I, I see another question here. Um, or is it a declarable, declared job? Um, I'm not sure. Or do you think job is uh, transformation is a job for everybody in the organization? Thank, thanks, Patrick, for asking the question. Um, so, I um, is it a job for everyone in the organization? Well, see, here's the deal. For the whole organization to transform, everyone has to go on their journey. Everyone has to go on the journey to the new future, to the new way of working. And so the way it works is the, you know, the leadership team, if they go on the journey, they become a very, very powerful attractor to attract everyone else to take the journey as well. And of course, I'm out here inviting the leadership team to take that initial journey, right? That's why, this, that's why we have to start on ourselves first. So I've gone on my journey, and then I invite the leadership team to go on their journey, and then they go on their journey, and then they invite everyone else to go on their journeys, right? And then that's how the whole thing transforms, right? And some people get invited to go on the journey and they go, no, 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 I don't want to go on this journey. And then the leadership teams that are really good, they say, well, this is the journey we're going on. If you don't like the journey, you, you're welcome to leave. You, we really appreciate you working here, but if you don't want to go on the journey with us, you, there's no future for you in this organization. Hey, can we help you find a job somewhere else? And they go, oh, oh, okay, thank you. And they, they do. Or they decide they want to go on the journey. Um, I think in good to great they talked about getting people on the bus or off the bus or something like that. Um, great. So I see some more questions here. Uh, how is engagement measured? I, I measure engagement using the 12 questions from Gallup. Um, these are scientifically proven to be linked to business unit performance. So basically the math is higher engagement, higher business unit performance. Um, so that's how I measure it with my clients. Um, it turns out to be working pretty well for them. Uh, there may be better ways, and if you do, just please let me know. Um, Michael Spade has a question. Do you agree it is higher on engagement in con do, do you agree it's higher in engagement in consciousness? Okay. Um, okay, other questions here. Uh, I think those are all the questions I see in the chat window. Are there, so I was looking, there's a Q&A area. Are there other questions in the chat window that I did not respond to? I'm just trying to scroll now. Okay. Any any other questions, either through the chat or uh, for people who are live in in person?
Michael, what's next for you? Um, that is a really good question. <laughs> um, so what's next for me? So what I realized is, uh, well, my purpose, my life purpose is raising the consciousness level of organizations, healing people, healing organizations. That, that's my why. That's why I'm here. And what I realized is that um, I want to have a bigger impact. And um, I'm busy with client work now, and I realize that I want to actually help people um, who want to do the same kind of thing that I'm doing. So I have some, some vague notion of having a, a catalyst camp, or maybe it's a guide camp, um, transformation guide camp or something like that, like either late this year or early next year. So if anyone's interested in that, please uh, do reach out to me and let me know, and I'll keep you informed of what's going on around that. That's, that's, that's one part of it. Another part of it is part of becoming part of a teal organization. So an organization of people like me who want to help make the world a better place um, and want to operate with this, like a, new, like a more, like well, yeah, a teal operating system, right? A teal level of conscious operating system for how we organize, how we work together, and, and so on. Um, yeah, so that's what's next for me. Oh, I see another question here. Um, is the model you describe compatible with Otter's eight-step model? Um, hmm. Otto Sharma. So I'm wondering if Otter's eight-step model would be Otto Sharma's eight-step model um, around Theory U. Uh, and yeah, so what I'm talking about is like very much, very closely tied with Theory U and presencing. Um, it's about being present in the current environment, sensing what's there, responding to it. So, um, yeah, I think they're, they're, they're just really talking about the same thing. I haven't, like, super looked at that model super, super closely, but it seems, like, very, very much aligned. Great, great question. Thank you, Natasha. If I answer that correctly, if not, please uh, ask another yeah, question. Yeah, that, that sounds that like, like uh, Cotter's model. Cotter's model. Um, well, Cotter's model is different. Cotter's model is about do you have a sense of urgency and is about change initiative. Whereas Theory U and some of the stuff I'm talking about here is about being present to what's going on. Like we think about what's the voice of the system, what is the what do people want for themselves? Um, well, I guess Cotter Motor could kind of fit in that. You know, it is your sense of urgency around change. Um, but presencing is kind of a much more general um, view of how things are working. Okay. Um, hmm. So great. Any any other questions? Oh, it's Cotter. It's supposed to be Cotter's eight step model. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, so the, the yeah, so I'd say Cotter's model is very different. Cotter, I used to use Cotter's model. Um, you know, oh, I need to start with a sense of urgency, right? I, you know, leaders have to treat this urgently. Now, so th so that's that's kind of really biased towards transformation. It's very very coercive and aggressive because um, it's biased towards agile is the outcome, transformation is the outcome. We need a change model. We need urgency. How do I create urgency? Right? That's very coercive. The model I'm proposing is actually the exact opposite. It's it's oh. Well, what does the system want for itself? What is here for people? And noticing what's there. It may be urgency, it may not be urgency, right? It's whatever, whatever's showing up, right? Like, let me give you an example. One client is with, people are late for the start of uh, training, and I go, well, wh what do we do? Like, is this normal? Like, is this your culture? And they go, well, yeah, you know, people are late, and it's a 9.30 meeting. We don't, we don't normally start 9.30 meetings, so we're totally okay with people being late. And that's and I go, oh, how, how's this working for you? They go, it's working great for us. I go, okay, good. Another company, they go, well, how's this working for you? They go, oh, this is not working for all. This is not how we want to be as a company. Anyone who's late is going to do push-ups, right? <laughs> it's, like, it's like asking people what do they want for themselves. And I got very, very different answers in the span of about, I think, two weeks that these, these trainings were apart. And it's like, wow, okay, this is beautiful. And they're picking what's right for their context, right? And, you know, whereas I externally might have some judgment around, well, Really? It's just okay for people to be late? I mean, certainly in an agile context, they'd be like, ah, that's for, you know, verboten. You know, that's like breaking the rules or something, right? Anyway, so that would be an example of, of, of how I'd see, um, you know, what the approach I'm talking about here is, is quite, quite different. Okay, good question. Uh, other questions? Hmm. Okay. Well, um, thank, thanks so much for, for joining, everyone. I really appreciate you uh, participating in this. I hope this has been valuable for you. And if you have any follow-up questions or want to reach to me, to me after, uh, 
uh, afterwards, please uh, please feel free, free to do so. Um, and uh, have, a, have a beautiful uh, evening or whatever time of day it is for you. All right, bye-bye. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. Thank See you later. Okay. All right, bye.